The ayes have it. The ayes have it. I have received notice from the Minister for Infrastructure that she wishes to make a statement. Before I call the Minister, I remind members that in light of social distancing being observed by parties, I have relaxed the Speaker's ruling that members must be in the chamber to hear a statement if they want to ask a question. Members do still have to make sure their name is on the speaking list if they wish to be called, but they can do this by rising in their place as well as notifying the business office or the table here directly. I remind members to be concise in asking their question to the Minister. This is not an opportunity for debate. Long introductions will not be allowed. I call the Minister for Infrastructure, Mrs Nicola Malam. Uh, thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, for the opportunity to update members on the ways in which my department is responding to the coronavirus pandemic. We have now entered into our ninth week of restrictions on the ways in which we have all previously lived. These restrictions have imposed significant challenges on our family life, our communities and economy. But, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, they have saved lives. It is crucially important that representatives and the public know their actions have protected our health service, slowed the spread of this deadly virus, and protected our families and our communities. The people of Northern Ireland, the politicians in Northern Ireland, for the first time in a very long time, we have all come together, showing when we work together, we can take steps forward even in times of crisis and unprecedented change. As we start to take early, tentative steps towards recovery, maybe seeing relatives and friends outdoors for the first time in months. It is important for us to remember why we must continue our resolve in our fight against coronavirus. It is so important that we do not act in any way that could undermine the huge sacrifices we have all made so far. As your Minister for Infrastructure, it is my responsibility to play my part in both our fight against COVID-19 and in our roadmap to recovery. Throughout this period, members will know that my department has worked tirelessly to find solutions to the countless challenges this crisis has produced. And I am delighted to say that today I can announce further progress that will assist citizens across the North. One of those challenges which has proven more complex to resolve is the issuing of driving licences requiring medicals during this crisis. I am pleased to say that a solution is now imminent. As I announced earlier, a new EU regulation will become law in coming days, meaning that driving licences with an expiry date between the 1st of February and the 31st of August 2020 will be treated as valid for a further seven months. This extension will automatically apply to all driving licences expiring during this period, and for some lorry and bus drivers, it will remove the requirement to have a medical assessment conducted at this difficult time. It will also help any customers who could not access or were finding it difficult to renew their driving licences online. The extension will also allow DVA to start processing provisional driving licences again. Road safety is my key priority, and I would therefore remind all drivers that they have a responsibility to notify the DVA if they have a new or worsening medical condition or disability that may affect their ability to drive. I very much regret that the extension provisions cannot be applied to taxi driver licences as they are not covered by the EU Driving Licence Directive. However, for those taxi drivers who do not have a medical condition to declare, my department will renew their five-year taxi driver's licence without a medical report, though they may be asked to submit a medical report at some future date. For those with a medical condition, I will do everything within my power to ensure that they are prioritised for medical appointments and licence renewal. This will be a welcome reassurance for many drivers. And I know many members have contacted me over concerns from their constituents. I am grateful to my team in DVA and across the department who have worked to find solutions that will help many drivers here. I am also well aware that the continued suspension of vehicle testing services has caused significant inconvenience for those customers that require certification for specialist vehicles and where a temporary exemption certificate is not applicable. I have listened to representatives from the freight and manufacturing industries, and given the impact that the suspension has had on business and the delivery of essential services, 
I am pleased to confirm that from the 1st of June, the DVA will introduce a statutory authorisation process that will permit the continued use of ADR vehicles on our roads, provided strict conditions and control measures are in place for these heavy vehicles. I can also advise that proposals to reinstate IVA testing safely from the 1st of June are at an advanced stage, and following consultation with staff and unions, a risk assess process has been agreed in line with social distancing guidance to ensure my staff and our customers are protected during the testing process. I am committed to ensuring that staff in DVA, indeed across my department, feel safe and supported as they return to deliver essential services. As part of my ongoing commitment, I have asked that engagement must continue with the unions to ensure that as we move forward, we do it together, supporting and protecting workers as they work to protect customers and deliver services. Comprehensive advice and guidance will issue to customers shortly and will be available on the NI Direct website on all of these positive steps. I know that there are a number of other DBA services which have been suspended, and I can assure members that each will be considered, risk assessed and resumed as soon as it is safe to do so. The focus of my department's work has been finding creative solutions to problems arising from COVID-19, and I'm proud my team has been able to deliver so much over the last number of months. On roads, we have focused on emergency repair work, However, as we are now in stage one of the executive's recovery process, it is appropriate to extend the works carried out by my department in relation to maintenance of public roads. As our contractors, both internal and external, have come to grips with new ways of working that allow staff and the public to be safe when carrying out works, confidence has built to an extent that resurfacing and surface dressing programmes and minor capital work schemes are now being taken forward. This decision was not taken lightly and involved discussions with the industry and trade unions, as well as with officials on both the engineering and the health and safety sides. But let me be clear, these works will only be allowed if the contractors involved provide evidence that the risks have been properly assessed and addressed, and mitigation measures such as compliance with social distancing requirements and provision of appropriate PPE can be met and are adhered to. I am committed to moving forward when and where we can, but to do that, I must be absolutely assured that health and safety is protected. As members will be aware, the Department of Infrastructure is vital to our recovery. Our work in running water, public transport, road services will underpin our economic recovery and development. This was true before COVID, but now it is even more fundamental. We need, as a government, indeed as an assembly and as a society, to invest in infrastructure if we are going to build our way into the new normal, developing a new world that supports growth and seizes this opportunity for real change. Change will be easy at times and at others much more difficult. And as we look to recovery, there will be difficult decisions for the executive and for ministers. The stark reality is that resources are low and the job of government is to make decisions that will best protect our communities. That means being open, honest and transparent. I want to advise members that it is no secret that my department is facing significant budgetary challenges, those I have inherited and new pressures from loss of income due to COVID-19. I welcome the Executive's commitment to support public transport going forward and its allocation of £30 million to my department towards helping to address these funding pressures. However, I must be honest with the Assembly that I am growing increasingly concerned that to date we have not seen the same recognition and understanding of the funding crisis that NI Water is experiencing as a direct result of COVID-19. Members, the public and businesses expect Northern Ireland Water to look after our health and well-being through access to clean water and proper sanitation. Likewise, Northern Ireland Water, as a publicly owned company, is rightly looking to the executive to provide the essential funding it needs to replace the lost income and increased costs of the current pandemic. Going forward, whether it's washing our hands, building more homes, helping businesses restart, Northern Ireland Water is fundamental 
and I hope the Assembly across all parties will support me in ensuring that resources are directed to protect our communities and economy as we look to recovery. And while investment in infrastructure means we get the basics right, we can protect our water system, our public transport network, keep the lights on and our roads safe, it is through infrastructure that we can also transform our communities, improving lives, making Northern Ireland an attractive place to live, visit, work and to start a business. It's time for us all to start thinking bigger and bolder. I fully acknowledge that lockdown has been challenging and that many people have been waiting and longing for things to return to normal. But in looking back, we need to consider the best of what normal entailed, what we have learnt over past months, and imagine and plan for a better, greener, healthier, happier future. I have said it before, and I will say it again, we need to seize the chance for change. And for that reason, I also want to provide you with some further detail on how my department and I will be leading a green recovery. Since social distancing measures and lockdown were introduced, air pollution across all of Europe has dropped measurably. Northern Ireland is no different. Transport is the second biggest contributor to greenhouse gases here, and with far less traffic on the roads, the benefits to our environment have been immediate and significant. But the reality is that as more of us move back to our workplaces and get out and about, our traffic volumes will increase again. In my last statement to the Assembly, I announced that I would be creating within my department a walking and cycling champion to spearhead delivery of our commitment to increase the percentage of journeys made by walking and cycling. I have already invited stakeholders to join an advisory group to help the champion to identify opportunities so that we can move quickly in making changes on the ground. I want to build real momentum and we are seeing progress. Some of the interventions being trialled and tested may be only needed for a short time, but in the longer term, I will be considering permanent changes to our streetscapes that will transform how our town centres facilitate walking and cycling. Above all, I am determined to make changes that will underpin a green recovery and improve public health. While I am focused on the prize of a sustainable future, one immediate need is helping people with social distancing in our city and town centres. As a result, my department is currently taking forward pilots in Belfast, Derry and Newry. In Belfast, Hill Street and Gordon Street in the Cathedral Quarter have been pedestrianised and footpaths widened across the Linen Quarter. In Derry, I will provide extra space for people along the riverfront and will work with the Council and other stakeholders to bring forward plans for reducing traffic within the city walls as businesses begin to reopen. We are also working in partnership with Newry, Mourne and Down District Council on innovative solutions in Newry. Initially, changes will be made with cones and temporary barriers. If something does not work, I will remove it and try something else. My department will be flexible and responsive, but it will not be afraid to try new approaches. I am grateful for the support and can-do attitude and approach of the three councils my officials have been working with so far in bringing early ideas to fruition. It is so important that in partnership we learn from each other as we navigate our way through these unprecedented times to deliver for all of our citizens. As well as creating a number of pop-up cycle lanes, my department is also looking at ways we can support communities, particularly those in disadvantaged inner city communities, who do not have easy access to space for recreation and leisure. I have no interest in imposing change from on high. Councils, local businesses and communities know what will work best in their locality and change will only last if we work in partnership. That is my commitment, that is my approach. But this is only one example of how my department is helping to shape our recovery. In conversations with business, the green sector and other stakeholders, the understanding that infrastructure spending will be crucial in restarting the economy is reiterated time and time again. In the wake of COVID, but also with the looming disaster of Brexit that faces these islands, we all need to roll up our sleeves. We must now get to grips with the serious pressures. That means working together. It means working inside government, outside, across the public and private sectors, across these islands, we need to be willing partners and ambitious leaders. This is our chance for change. 
our opportunity to show that leadership in this Assembly, in the Executive, can deliver for our citizens and our communities. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. I thank the Minister uh, for making her statement to the House. Before I call uh, the Chair of the Infrastructure Committee to ask her question, I remind members this is not a meeting of the Ad Hoc Committee on the response to COVID-19. Therefore, it is established in standing orders that questions on this statement will last an hour. They will not last an hour and 15 minutes. So members must be succinct and ask their questions um, directly, and ministers must be succinct in their answers also. I call the Chair of the Infrastructure Committee, Ms Michelle McElveen. Uh, thank you, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, and welcome the content of the Minister's statement, in particular the extension for driving licence renewals and the resumption of IVA testing. But I was disappointed to hear from the Finance Minister last week when he informed us that discussions in relation to support for our hauliers um, concluded that an intervention wasn't necessary and also that no package for the taxi industry had been presented to him for consideration. I'd be interested to hear from the Minister on those issues, but he also reiterated that furloughing staff was up to individual ministers and not the executive. Given the budgetary pressures across the department, including Northern Ireland Water, which has been highlighted in the statement, can I ask the Minister for clarity? At what point, if any, during this crisis did she or her officials ask TransLink, DVA and Community Transport to explore the possibility of furloughing staff? And in hindsight, was there more she or her officials could have done to lessen the financial pressures being felt in those areas of business? I thank the Chair for her question. Uh, on the issue of the hauliers, um, DERA is leading on that, and my department has been working uh, with a group of cross-departmental officials uh, in making the case to DFT and also to Treasury. Uh, but the Finance Minister is correct at this moment in time. It is Treasury's assessment that there isn't sufficient evidence to bring forward a financial package uh, for our haulage industry, but I can assure the member that my officials will continue to do all they can, working with JIRA and with the Department for Economy, because we recognise the importance, the critical role that our hauliers are playing during this crisis. On the issue of taxis, um, as the Chair of Committee, you will be aware of the number of correspondence that I have sent to executive colleagues on the need to provide support for our taxi industry, a support that is out with my department's responsibility as we are responsible for, for regulation. On the issue of furloughing, um, at the request of the Finance Minister, uh, my department carried out a detailed analysis on potential furloughing of TransLink staff and Northern Ireland Water. We presented that analysis to the Finance Minister. He hasn't come back to raise any additional concerns. Um, uh, so I'm assuming that he's accepting uh, that analysis. Uh, individual ministers are responsible uh, for uh, looking at the furloughing of their arm's length body. It is my understanding, however, that the furloughing of Northern Ireland civil service staff is a responsibility that lies with the finance minister. As Minister for Infrastructure, I cannot alter the terms and conditions of individual civil servants within my department, uh, but I can assure the Chair that I am aware of the difficult financial situation. I made a number of bids to the Executive. Only one has been accepted. That was the £30 million for TransLink out of the £95 million that was sitting centrally. Some of that money has gone to our uh, ferries uh, and to our airports. And so internally in my department, we're doing everything that we can. I think the reality is, though, that the financial situation facing the Department of Infrastructure prior to COVID was deeply, deeply concerning, and that has been compounded by the COVID crisis. I call Ms Liz Kimmins. Uh, good luck, please, and I thank the Minister for her statement. But, um, and whilst we, we of course are supportive of um, exploring ways to build sustainable infrastructure, and, and it's very much welcome, um, there have been concerns raised regarding in, in, by businesses and, and people in the community around the removal of parking spaces. I know it's, it's something that I've raised with you um, in the last number of days. And you had said there about the importance of not imposing change. Um, in, in areas when, when one goes through this, but um, there has been some confusion around this, particularly in my own constituency, around the plans for the city centre of Newry. And over the last few days, um, it, it's come to my attention that, that local businesses were informed pretty much last minute that plan, there were plans to start work yesterday. Um, so I'd ask the Minister, I know this has now been halted and that's been welcomed, but it, there needs to be proper and meaningful consultation with, with those businesses and um, the key stakeholders, as you've mentioned in, in, in your statement there this morning, um, because it is important. They know the locality 
best and they know what will work, work well for them. Um, so I'd ask the Minister just to elaborate on, on what our plans are to engage with those stakeholders going forward because there seems to be conflicting statements even from your colleagues on the ground in the area about whether the work was due to start or what's happening. So I think it's important because we want to do this right and it has to be done with the people and not to the people. I thank the member for uh, her question. She's absolutely right that it's really important that we do this and that we have to do that together. Um, the member will know that I did establish the Active Travel Champion who is leading on the consultation. And you may know that I'm due to meet with the council group leaders uh, to discuss plans this week. Um, my department has been working with the councils, and I've been very clear on this. My department can provide the drive and impetus, but it is not best placed to provide the detail. Uh, local communities know what will work best, uh, and so I'm very clear that things have to be done in consultation with local councils and also with the partners within the, the council area. Uh, I'm very clear that I'm not imposing change from the top down, and I became aware of the confusion in Europe over the weekend. I can assure the member that I haven't signed off on any plans and um, so um, it's important as we learn through this that we understand how that confusion arose and that we learn from it to make sure that it doesn't happen in Uri, it doesn't happen uh, in any of our council areas across the north. I want to reassure the member I'm committed to partnership working, I'm committed to pursuing this active travel agenda and I'm also um, committed to tackling regional imbalance as well and so I look forward to working with her and with others as we deliver the change that will work on the ground. Mr Colin McGrath. Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for her statement and for the work uh, and leadership shown within uh, the Department during these difficult times. Um, Minister, I've been contacted by many in the community transport sector who deliver their fantastic work uh, for many of the most vulnerable within our community. Um, could you give some assurances for the community transport operators uh, over funding support as you look forward uh, to your budget? Thank you. Yes, I thank the member for his question and I very much recognise the vital role that community transport plays, particularly in our rural communities. I was keen to support the community transport sector in the redeployment of their services to help some of the most vulnerable during the COVID crisis uh, and they have made a tremendous contribution and I want to again put that on record. My officials did send letters to the community transport sector uh, of an interim quarterly payment and that was to provide some sense of reassurance and certainty at a time of great uncertainty while I am finalising budget uh, allocations but I want to just reiterate again I do recognise the importance of our community transport. I I think that they have demonstrated that over and beyond in terms of their response to the COVID crisis, and I am committed to supporting them going forward. Mr. Roy Beggs. The, the Minister has spoke of a need for a green recovery. Some capital infrastructure projects can reduce congestion in the middle of Belfast city centre, improve the air quality, uh, create construction jobs, and actually improve the efficiency of the whole Northern Ireland economy. Can the Minister provide an update of the progress of the York, Gate, York Street inter interchange, which will bring many, many benefits at many different levels, and it's important that it is progressed. Thank you. I thank the member for his question. I think that there's a danger of falling into uh, a, a kind of dichotomy here where you're either for active travel and against investment in our road network. I actually recognise that this is all part of getting us to the right place. On York Street, you'll be aware that it's an executive commitment. Um, it was subject to legal challenge, which has put the project back further, but it is uh, an executive commitment um, and it is something that will bring multiple uh, benefits, as the member has outlined. Mr. Andrew Muir. Thank you very much, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Uh, research was issued yesterday that 56% of commuters with a driving license who used public transport prior to the pandemic are considering buying a car and using private uh, the car as a means of transport. That's a matter of real concern. Um, in England, uh, a scheme has been announced where you get a £50 voucher to allow you to get, uh, cover the cost towards the repair of a bicycle. Is that something the Minister is considering introducing here? And also, when is the capital funding going to be released towards the Greenway funding? Um, again, I thank the member um, for his question. I think that you point to uh, a very concerning issue. 
and that is that given uh, the robustness actually of the messaging to people to stay at home and engage only in essential travel, that we do have a real issue when it comes to public confidence uh, in encouraging people to safely come back to use public transport. The member will be, be aware that TransLink have implemented a number of measures from protective screens uh, to deep cleaning to a range of policies and procedures to protect people in the use of public transport. I, You'll be aware that I've set up the Walking and Cycling Champion. She has been tasked, along with the steering group, at looking at a range of measures that have worked uh, right across the board. And I know that one of the issues that they will be examining is the issue of the voucher scheme that the member has raised. I call Mr David Hilditch. Deputy Speaker, I want to thank the Minister for a statement, a fairly positive statement, I have to say today. Uh, but could I have a we look at the, uh, the sort of active travel element to it? I know you've been discussing these matters with the, our, our cities of London, Derry, Belfast, and Uri. Can you can you give us some assurance that these schemes can also be rolled out throughout our other provincial towns? I can give that um, member the assurance. Yes, um, initial engagement has gathered momentum around the cities of Belfast, Derry and Newry, but that is not to the exclusion uh, of other areas. Uh, this will only work if we are able to roll it out. And so I'm very committed to engaging with councils right across the north, uh, with communities, with businesses, so that we can see the active travel agenda pursued and implemented right across Northern Ireland. Call Mrs Martina Anderson. And I want to thank the Minister for, for her statement. Um, Minister, as you would know, your department has received the, uh, the highest amount of capital spending that it ever has received, and I'm conscious of the nine years of austerity. But in your statement, you talked about road safety. So can you assure me, can you assure the people of Derry, can you assure the people of the North West that to allow in advance the, an address which you talked about with regard to road safety, regional inequalities and connectivity, that the two flagship projects, the A5 and the A6, that not alone are you fully committed to, it, uh, to both of those projects, but that they will continue to progress under your watch. As the member knows, I am committed to regional development. I am committed to the continued progression of the A5 and the A6. So the short, succinct answer to your question is yes. I call Ms Joanne Bunting. Thank you very much, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker. I welcome this statement this morning from the Minister. Um, and I would declare my membership of the Northern Ireland Policing Board. Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, over the last number of years, we have seen a steep decline in the number of taxis that there are to service our community. And included in that is a very low number of those who are equipped for wheelchair users. This is now coupled with a significant increase in drink driving over the lockdown period. I'm grateful for the Minister's uh, movement with regard to medicals and the extension of licences. But what, and I note her answer to the committee chair, but, but what is the state of progress uh, between herself, the Minister of the Economy and the Minister of Finance to assist this key sector. I thank the member um, for her question. Uh, on the issue uh, of taxis, I'm assuming that you're talking about the financial support for the sector. Uh, so, um, you're not on the committee, but um, the committee had requested just evidence, I think, of what I've been doing to try to raise the matter. And I've written to, I think it was from March, to both the economy and the finance minister. Um, I think that it is a sector that has been hard hit. Um, I think we need to understand um, how we can assist them. There's also the outstanding issue of social guidance as well uh, that I've been in correspondence with the uh, our economy minister on. I'm very clear that I recognise that the industry needs support. I'm also very clear that I want to work with all executive colleagues to ensure that our taxi drivers get support, but there are also a number of sole traders uh, who find themselves in a very similar situation who haven't been able to avail of the number of uh, hardship or financial support schemes that have come through from the Department uh, of the Economy. Uh, on this and all matters, I'm keen to work with executive colleagues. I think it's only when we work together, given that we have different roles and responsibilities and remits covering this particular issue, that we should be working to try to address it within the financial difficulties that we all currently face. On the issue of disability access to taxis, it is an issue that I recognise. I've been looking to see what they've been doing uh, in the Republic of Ireland, for example, uh, because and my steering committee in the walking and cycling champion efforts, for example, MTech sit on that. Uh, and so they are very clear that this is a, a particular issue. So disability access and the rights of our disability 
our community are something that I would like to see us doing more within my department and right across the executive. Commissioner Annis. Um, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, um, the Minister's statement talks about recovery um, and how she can play her part in that recovery. And can I suggest to her that one very obvious way that, that the Minister can play her part in that recovery is to finally make a decision on Caseman Park. It's a vital, um, it's a vital project. Uh, it has um, executive um, approval, um, and it will play a significant role in our, in our economic recovery. So, can I ask the Minister when will she finally give clarity and make a decision on Caseman Park? I thank the member for a question because it gives me a, a, an important opportunity to establish the facts. Uh, the member will be aware that my department is working at pace to process this application so that it can be brought as quickly as possible to me. This is a statutory process which must be completed before it comes up for a decision. I am sure no member or anyone with any interest in any planning application before my department would want due process not to be followed. On this application, I am advised that my department anticipates all necessary responses will be received soon and that officials can make a recommendation to me. I know that this is a long-awaited application and after three years of no government, it is important that progress is made across the board for our communities and for our economic recovery, particularly as we look to the future beyond the pandemic. Mr Pat Catney. Thank you, Mr Deputy. Principal Speaker. Um, Minister, thank you for your statement. Uh, very encouraging indeed. And my question is uh, uh, going forward, uh, are there any projects within your department that you find you might be able to roll out that much quicker that gives us a capital spend and is able to jumpstart or boot our economy as we come out of this crisis? I thank the member for his question. Um, there are a number uh, of executive projects, there are a number of capital projects referenced in New Decade, New Approach. Uh, work is continuing on the A5 and A6. Work has commenced on the uh, transport hub. Uh, and the member, as he points out, it's being recognised right across the world that infrastructure and investment in infrastructure is the bedrock to recovery. You know, we, we are facing a, a very difficult and serious recession. Uh, the evidence from around the world shows us that we need to be building our way out of that recession. That's why I'm key that my department can play its fullest role. And working with executive colleagues, we can see investment in our infrastructure and we can try to do exactly that, build our way out of the incoming recession. Mr Mike Nesbitt. Um, the Minister made reference to individual vehicle approval tests being resumed. Uh, could she clarify whether that will happen on the 1st of June or whether it remains to some extent a work in progress? And when it does resume, will the prioritisation of vehicles delivering essential services include bin lorries? I can assure the member that the IVA testing will resume uh, on the 1st of June and that there will be a prioritisation process uh, because we recognise the critical role that key workers are playing and that it does uh, include our bin lorry. So yes, it will commence on the 1st of June and also there will be a prioritisation uh, uh, process. Mr Cahill Boylan. Good pre last concorder. Uh, thank you Mr Deputy Speaker. Um, and I could thank the Minister for her statement. And I welcome the measures, but she did indicate that the taxi industry may lose out in terms of driver licensing in some cases. I could ask the Minister, will she commit to look at other ways uh, in relation to the licensing, so maybe look at um, discounting the cost of renewals, because I think it's over £100, given the, the heavy burden they're under at the minute. I thank the member for his question. Uh, the member will know that we have issued free of charge the six-month extension to PS fees. Um, taxi drivers without a medical condition to declare will automatically now get, when they apply, a five-year uh, extension. Uh, some may be asked within that to provide a medical assessment. There is a difficulty that it is proving enormously complex to resolve, and that is for those drivers who have a medical condition that they must declare. In all of these things, I have to try to balance up finding the solution while also recognising that I have a duty to road safety for both drivers, in the case of taxi drivers, the drivers themselves and their passengers. So the member will know that I announced that we were working in partnership with the BMA and GPs to ensure that those 
uh, taxi drivers and key workers who needed to have a medical assessment could get that. That is working in many, many places, and I want to put on record my appreciation. There are still some difficulties for those requiring specialist medical uh, assessments because of the strain on our health service, but I have set up uh, a dedicated um, email address I will put for taxi drivers who find themselves in this situation, and that will be fully available on NI Direct. So I'm very conscious that for that group of drivers requiring further specialist medical attention and assessment, it is difficult, but I will continue to do all I can to find a practical resolution to that that doesn't compromise their road safety. Mr Chris Little. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. I welcome the Minister's appointment of a walking and cycling champion in action on long overdue pedestrianisation of Cathedral Quarter. The Minister is talking of big and bold actions and of supporting inner city communities to access clean and active travel. So, can I ask the Minister what investment will be made in walking and cycling? Will this include the delivery of the Toucan walking and cycling crossing to link Braniel Estate to the Conswater Community Greenway? investment in on-road cycle training for children and adults, and greater access to trains and buses for cyclists. Again, I thank the member um, for his question and for his passion in this subject. Uh, I'm not in a position to be able to uh, highlight specific projects and the projects that you've named, but I can assure you that we are working through budget allocations to try to have uh, to put force behind this, if you like. I'm very cognizant of the fact that you can do all you can to promote walking and cycling, but if you do not facilitate safe spaces in which to do so, then people will not be able to engage in it. So I can assure him that we are working, led by the Walking and Cycling Champion, with people from right across uh, society in terms of the steering group, but also with local councils. And I hope to be in a position very soon where we're able to confirm the specifics of the projects that will be taken forward uh, in conjunction with the councils. Mr John O'Dowd. And thank the Minister for her statement and question, our answers thus far. Um, the, the Minister has referred to building our way out of the, uh, our, the recession, which is coming towards us, and, and building our way out of it. Will the Minister uh, commit today to bringing forward legislation to allow those individuals and, and, and groups who have planning permission, and that is now running to an end, for an extension to be brought forward? My colleague Liz Cummins has raised with us this issue several occasions with her, but to date we have not had a commitment to bring the legislation forward. And the Minister will note that, for instance, the Communities Minister has been able to bring legislation through the House quite quickly. So the House can give consent to speedy legislation when necessary. I thank the member for his question, um, and it is an issue that I have been very conscious of. Um, the issue of expiring planning permission, it is very difficult to quantify uh, the extent of that problem. I have tasked officials with doing that, but what they are saying to me is that it is very difficult to assess what, how many have had works commenced and how many have not. That is not to say that this is not an issue. Uh, and the member will know that I have said that we were exploring legislative options because primary legislative change is required in this instance. There had been discussions that uh, the executive would be bringing forward a coronavirus bill, and we had hoped to place this piece of legislation within that. I am still exploring a piece of individual legislation in this regard. I am trying to weigh up, as the construction works recommence, what is the best and most efficient and effective solution uh, for people, but I can assure the member that I have not taken the legislative option off the agenda. We are assessing it, and we will continue to assess it. In the interim, we have provided advice. The Chief Planner has sent out uh, correspondence to all of the councils. The, the option here is that you could renew. It is at a much reduced uh, fee, not ideal, uh, and now there is the, the added option of having commencements work started, given that we are seeing the easements in terms of construction work. Mr Matthew Tull. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Thank you to the Minister for the update. Um, she talked about the difficulties facing Northern Ireland Water. Could she just spell out in a little bit more detail what that will mean for communities, including building, if we don't get more funding for Northern Ireland Water? And could I also briefly ask her to confirm that in relation to the development of Casement Park, Ulster GAA fans and others who are interested in this development will want to ensure that this process is done properly so that there are no more challenges. And it's pointless trying to push uh, a speedy decision on this which will result in the development either falling through or more objections. Could she confirm that, please? Uh, I can confirm to the member, and I think that I would hope that this would be a case across the board, regardless of party politics and point scoring. Um, Every application should be assessed and should be following due process. I think my job as the Infrastructure Minister is to do my job right, 
uh, not to do it rushed, and that's what I'm committed to doing. On the issue of Northern Ireland Water, uh, Northern Ireland Water, the member will know, provides vital public services across Northern Ireland, ensuring that it's financially supported is not only fundamental to Northern Ireland Water's future, but it's critical for protecting our communities. I think it's important to point out the facts. Firstly, businesses have closed due to the COVID-19 restrictions, leading to a funding gap in Northern Ireland Water of £30 million. Secondly, despite the fall in business use, demand for water has increased overall during lockdown as we are using more water at home. Sewer blockages have also increased with more wet wipes being flushed down drains and Northern Ireland Water has also had to adapt working practices to keep its frontline staff safe and all of this means that they are incurring extra costs. Thirdly, Northern Ireland Water is a regulated utility with a delivery plan that has been carefully and independently scrutinised by the utility regulator and a requirement to deliver a challenging efficiency programme which it has done and continues to do. Fact four, Northern Ireland Water cannot access any of the COVID business support mechanisms for rates relief or loans that are available to the private sector. And finally, and perhaps most crucially, Northern Ireland Water provides the most vital of services to our population, providing clean drinking water and taking away and treating wastewater, protecting our health at the very time that we need it most. How anyone can defend not providing Northern Ireland water with the support it needs uh, baffles me. The fact is that if we don't invest in our water and wastewater infrastructure, we won't be able to build the homes that we need, we won't be able to grow our economy, and we won't be able to properly recover from this crisis. Call Mrs. Rosemary Barton. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Minister, thank you for your statement. Uh, in your statement, you talked about looking forward to economic recovery, etc., and you also talked about you also have obviously that would include capital projects. You, there are a number of projects that I've heard spoken about, in particularly in the east of the province. Can I ask you what plans you have for um, for bringing forward some of the projects in the west, particularly southwest, such as the Enniskillen Bypass? I thank the member for her question and I recognise that, that is an important project uh, and the member has raised it with me uh, a couple of times. Um, yes, we are in the process of finalising in terms of the capital projects that we are uh, intending to bring forward and I hope to be in a position very, very soon to be able to update the committee uh, and also update members across the House on those decisions. Mr Mark Durkin. Uh, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, I thank uh, the Minister for her responses today and her response and her department's response to uh, the crisis that has engulfed us. I'd like to commend the Minister not only on her response to the crisis but on her vision and looking beyond the crisis, particularly in the sphere of active travel. I was excited to learn of the Minister's proposals for uh, my, my own constituency, Derry City, and our active travel plans there. I wonder if she could outline uh, some of them to us. And I'm hopeful that they in the future include the commencement of the Strathfoyle Greenway. <laughs> Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, the member never misses an opportunity to talk about this particular Greenway. Uh, yes, we, I have announced that we are looking at uh, uh, works around uh, pedestrianising and widening uh, streets and around the riverfront. We're also working with the local council uh, as well about identifying other opportunities for change. And again, this week coming, uh, I am engaging with the group leaders across Derry City Council because I think it's very important, you know, as I spoke about earlier, that we do these things in partnership. There's no point in me coming into areas and imposing change. I need to be working with local councils, local businesses, and with local communities to understand what will work best in their locality, and that's what I'm committed to doing in Derry, uh, but also right across Northern Ireland. Ms Rachel Woods. Thank you, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for her statement to the House today, in particular the ongoing recognition of the need of a green recovery and a just transition. Can I ask the Minister if councils are not involved in doing the work or piloting projects now uh, on reallocation of road space, how can communities who want to look at specific areas in their towns and villages communicate this with the Department? I would encourage them to contact the department directly. They can contact the walking and cycling champion or alternatively come through uh, members to my private office or come through directly to me via my own private office at the Department for Infrastructure. Mr Tim Allister. Thank you. Uh, could I take the minister back to the lack of financial support for the haulage sector? Um, I heard what you said to the chair which was the effect that the Department of Transport and Treasury said there was no need 
for support. But in fact, last week in this chamber, the finance minister, when he was asked by me about this, said, I know that part of the transportation money that we had been holding back was in anticipation of a request in that area. That did not emerge, and we went ahead then with the allocation to Translink. That's very different from saying the Treasury decided there wasn't funds. That's the Minister of Finance saying there was a pot of money, transportation money, sitting in his department, awaiting an application to support the haulage industry. It didn't come, and the money instead went to Translink. Is that correct? And if so, why was the haulage sector neglected? And if I might, in her pursuit of green energy, would you undertake to visit and meet with Wright Bus and discover the exciting plans they have for hydrogen buses, which, of course, Transwing could greatly benefit from? I thank the member uh, for his question. Uh, the member will know that my department uh, has been working closely with DERA and with the Department for Economy on the issue of hauliers. The member may also be aware that 95 million came across uh, and was being held centrally um, for a transport package. Uh, from that 95 million pound has come the support package for the ferries. Uh, from that uh, 95 million has come the support package for the airports. 30 million has been allocated across for Translink, but 59 million pounds is being retained in the centre uh, for that transport package. I can only advise members on what I know. Uh, I understand very clearly that we have been engaging in trying to make the case uh, for our haulage industry and we've been working with the industry and in providing the evidence for that. Uh, we have been informed by Treasury um, in our engagement with uh, the devolved uh, ministers and DFT that the analysis uh, undertaken by the Treasury is indicating for them at this moment in time that there is not the evidential base for a financial support package. I, I can only report on what I know. of your uh, invitation. Uh, I'm happy to meet anyone. The Advanced Green Recovery Agenda. Mr Jerry Carroll. Uh, thank you. The Minister mentioned the importance of listening. I would agree with her on that and I would urge her department, uh, uh, her as a minister and other uh, executive ministers, to listen to the concerns about residents in the Casement Park area, especially about overdevelopment. Um, Previously, I raised with the Minister concerns over Belfast road service workers not having appropriate uh, PPE, despite raising it several times with the Department. Uh, I, would let, I would urge the Minister to intervene here. It is still an ongoing problem to ensure that these workers who are working on roads, gullies and other works have protective uh, equipment. Um, and I would like to ask the Minister, given that these uh, are ongoing concerns, what assurances can she give us that, as her Department moves towards recommencing minor capital works, that workers carrying out this work uh, will be protected and have uh, appropriate equipment. I thank the member for raising a very important issue. Um, the continuation of construction works is in line with current government advice. Uh, the businesses should encourage their employees to work at home where possible, but accepting that certain jobs require people to travel to their place of work. While construction work was never included in the list of activities subject to closure or restrictions, it has been necessary to develop new safe systems of working and to invest additional PPE to allow the various operations to be carried out safely. And because of this, I was only initially prepared to allow my department's internal contractor to carry out emergency work. However, as additional PPE was procured and safe working systems were developed in consultation with trade unions, I have allowed additional road maintenance and flood alleviation work to proceed, including a wide range of road maintenance operations and water course maintenance. Also, in addition to allowing our private contractors to complete work that had already been started or ordered, I have now permitted new road surfacing, surface dressing and minor works to, to proceed. But as I made very clear uh, in my statement, uh, works will only proceed if there are guarantees and assurances that workers are being kept safe. And I'm, very, I'm clear also that if that is not the case, then I need to be made aware of it immediately. I have asked officials for very regular updates on PPE right across my department, the provision of it for workers. Uh, from TransLink, Northern Ireland Water, right across the department. And I've also made it clear that with the ongoing engagement with workers and trade unions, I want to be made aware of any safety concerns that workers have raised that haven't been addressed. Mr. Keith Buchanan. Principal Deputy Speaker, I thank the Minister so far for her uh, answers. My question or query is regarding 
existing DVA services, as you referred to, and would like to know basically from the Minister what state of readiness is the MOT centres are for whatever the time is safe to do so. I appreciate they're doing all the work at present. So when will they be you know, fit to operate whenever it's safe to do so? The member will know that we initially said that we were suspending the DVA t testing services until the 22nd of June. I am keeping that under review, um, and I'm clear that when it is safe to do so, we will reopen uh, the centres, and we will be doing so in consultation with workers and trade unions. The member will also know from being on the committee that the installation programme for the new lifts has commenced, and it is due for completion um, by July, which will greatly assist with the situation. That's aside from the three centres that are being used as COVID testing centres, and I have made it clear to the, fine, or to the Health Minister that if he requires any additional MOT centres as we roll out community testing, then he will have first priority uh, use. But to reassure the member, um, I'm very conscious of um, public health advice. I'm very conscious, obviously, of the executive's own pathway to recovery, and I will be taking my decisions in line with all of that. Mr Justin McNulty. Minister, in your statement, you refer to getting things done when politicians work together. Isn't it a terrible shame that Casement Park didn't get over the line when Sinn Féin held the ministry and was further held back by the collapse of Stormont for three years? Given that investment in infrastructure is going to be key to economic recovery, what discussions, if any, have the Ministers for the Economy and Finance had with you to plan for economic recovery. I thank the member for his question. I think that there is uh, frustration right across the board in Northern Ireland at uh, the missed opportunities in terms of what could have been advanced uh, when we had three years without uh, any government. Uh, I've been very clear about the role of infrastructure, the importance of infrastructure investment in the green recovery, but also building uh, us out of a recession. Uh, I will make, continue to make that case with executive colleagues. And look, I acknowledge we are in very difficult financial times. Every department is struggling with inescapable pressures. But as an executive, we have a duty to be supporting and protecting our private sector. We also have a duty uh, and responsibility to protect our critical public services, that is, our public transport and Northern Ireland water. And so I will continue to engage with executive colleagues because it's in all of our interest to ensure that we do protect those critical public services. Mr Johnny Buckley. Speaker, and I thank the Minister for her statement today. Minister, you are well aware of the delay in many works across your department due to COVID-19. And as we start to move towards normality, would the Minister commit to working with me in trying to help those residents of uncompleted developments across Northern Ireland? I think there are three that stretch back as far as the financial crash that have not been able to see their roads tarmacked, their uh, water mains connected due to mishaps with the developer and NI Water. Would you commit to working with me in particular with Birchwood Manor to see the completion of these developments and allow residents to live at peace? The member will be aware that it is a very complex issue. There are the issues of unadopted roads and there's legal ramifications from that in terms of what my department can do. But I'm keen to work with all members, so happy to meet with you or Zoom, given the current set of circumstances, uh, to, to see what we can do working together. Thank you. I thank the members for the succinctness of their questions and the minister for the succinctness of her answers. 36 minutes and all done, so well done. Uh, we now move on to a motion on the supply resolution for the Northern Ireland estimates. Further vote on account.